Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you that we can gather this morning in the name of your great Son, Jesus our Lord, who goes before us in resurrection power, having conquered sin, death, and hell. Open our hearts this morning to that great power. Be one who is strong on our behalf today, even as we turn to you and ask for your deliverance. Speak to us, Lord, for your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It is a joy and, in fact, an honor to be here this morning. I am very, very grateful for the invitation of your rector to come and preach this morning following Vijay's ordination to the priesthood yesterday, which is one glorious celebration, just glorious. I actually am inviting you as the preacher on the first Sunday of Lent into something of an adventure. Journey doesn't quite capture it. And even adventure doesn't give you everything that there is. But as you can see from the very beginning, when we began to circle you in prayer, offering to God together the great litany, we're invited in essence to a reality that is always present, but not always recognized. It's because in the litany itself, in stark contrast, to what we hear from many of our fellows and what we hear on the news is in fact more than just a series of prayers. It is in fact a different way of looking at the world. It is a different way of viewing ourselves, who God is, the role that we play, and in fact, as the epistle says, treasures that are available to us as believers in Jesus Christ. Anything but modeling, just the opposite, a trumpet call to humility and in fact action born of prayer, fasting in the disciplines of Lent. It is a call to be armed for battle, to take our place in the world unashamed, head held high, as servants of Jesus Christ, being willing for him to open the doors for us to discover the places where he has called us to serve and to be willing to sacrifice whatever it takes that we might be faithful in the places where God has put us. That's what I think of <laughs> when I think of Lent. You see, it, it, it's really not about what you give up. Unless what you give up are conscious choices that you make to let go of things that in fact inhibit your freedom to be available for Jesus to use you. Those are things worth giving up. It's really anything but a liturgical excuse for a diet. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we've inherited a kind of puritanism that causes us to think Lent as Lent, within the context of the word, the liturgical word, is shriven. Now, shriven's not a bad thing, but shriven, even that has to do with repentance of those things that stand in the way of our being faithful servants to Jesus. And all of us need that kind of wake-up call, the cold ice water in the face, because our tendency is to think either far better of ourselves than we deserve, are far less than ourselves that we deserve. And therefore, to make a right beginning of repentance, which the liturgy says to us on Ash Wednesday, there's an adjustment that needs to happen in the way that we view both God and ourselves. Because the point you see of Lent is to find new ways to draw closer to him, to discover things about his life and character, that we did not know, or only did in the kind of embryonic form. And therefore, there is a hunger in us to discover God as God truly is, not who we imagine God to be. Example. I'm in my third year of seminary. One would have thought I'd figured out something about God at that point. But actually, what began to happen to me in my third year of seminary 
was I began to discover how much I didn't know. And not only how much I didn't know, but the things that I believed about God that were in fact patently false. false. I still remember a late night conversation with a seminarian, which is part and parcel of what it means to be in seminary, is to have late night conversations, talking theology, often over beer and well into the night. And I'm telling my friend, Ralph was his name, a little bit of my story, and in the midst of a very kind of um, re relaxed, non-intrusive way, has God ever done this to you, where you're listening to somebody and all of a sudden it's almost as if the character of the other person's voice changes ever so slightly, and God speaks to you. That's what happened. I'm talking to Ralph, and we're having this conversation. And he said, you know, Greg, when I listen to you, I get the idea that you see the Christian life as a kind of high wire act. That God put you up there, and your job as a Christian is, in essence, to get from here to there across the wire. It's very far down. But there is a net. That's what grace is, you see, in my kind of typology. There is a balance beam that helps me, but I still am really up there all by myself. And God is on the other side going, come on, you can do this, you can do this. And I am up there actually in stark terror, praying that if I fall, the net catches me, or that somehow there's enough strength in my body to be able to do something that I could never actually do in the physical, ever in my whole life. And I realized quite honestly, that that was actually an inaccurate picture of what the Lord was asking of me. It was an accurate picture of my feelings, but it was not something that God was asking of me. You see, and this is a quote from a man I admire. His name is Chuck DeGroat. He said, God is not a stressed out helicopter parent living through his children, nervously and fretfully hovering over us, to make sure we stick to the script so that it all works out in the end. No, God is a wise parent inviting us into spiritual maturity in a secure atmosphere of unconditional love and acceptance so that we can learn to navigate life well, hearing his voice and welcoming his leadership. That is not the life on a high wire. But you see, it had everything to do with what I had been taught. And what I had been taught was there were high expectations. You, in fact, could fulfill them. It will be difficult, but it will, in fact, be worth the effort. Because in the end, who you are is what you have become and what you accomplish. Scripture doesn't say that. <laughs> And so the High Wire Act was, in fact, the fruit of seeing God through the lens of what it was that I had been taught. And because that's how I thought of God, high expectations, serious performance value, give it all you've got, and let's see what you can do with your life. I mean, that's the wrong way to read, for example, the story of the parable of the talents. You know, I give you two, well done, good and faithful servant, I get yours in the ground. But when I heard that parable read in the church that I attended as a kid, I saw it as a weapon. As in, you got a lot, you better live up to what you have. I can almost hear my father saying that to me even now. But what, I think, what happens is that when you get that kind of skewed picture of God, you actually begin to relate to that skewed picture. That's who you pray to. That's who you think God is in the depths of your soul. Well, in the biblical typology, what that is is an idol. Because it's not God at all. It's not what we see in the face of Jesus in any way, shape, or form. And what I began to face was is that what the Lord was very gently showing me, but decisively, was that I was in fact both the victim and the perpetrator of idolatry. That I had created an idol based on what I had been told life was, primarily through my mom and dad, and that that's how I thought about myself, and that's how I related to God. And what began to happen inside of me at that moment was extraordinary. 
Because in realizing that what I didn't know about God was a lot, it took me right back to the very beginning, and the cry of my heart became, oh Lord, show me who you really are. Remove the idol. It helped me see you as you have revealed yourself in the face of your son. Because Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Or as Paul says in Colossians, he, meaning Jesus, is the exact likeness of the invisible God. Meaning there is no daylight whatsoever between what we see in Jesus as we say in the creed, God from God, light from light. And who God is whom we cannot see. And that invited me into a whole different way of not only thinking about God, but also in thinking about myself. So that no longer was I living under the burden of the demand for accomplishment. But that instead, I began to receive a different way of viewing myself viewing God and even viewing the world. I was thinking about that at one point, and I began to write some phrases down that I want to share with you. I began to discover, for example, that the goal in life was not education, but wisdom. The goal is not money, but holiness. The goal is not merely adventure, but mission. The goal is not material accumulation, whether by earning it or by inheritance, but by but servanthood. The goal is not even a psychologically realized self, but a life changed into the image of Jesus Christ. The goal is not even the perpetration of a religious institution. You see, religious institutions traffic in things like education, money, material accumulation, and even the promise of a new realized self if you do what we ask you to do, all of which perpetrates a system that may or may not, in fact, actually lead us to the Son of God, but that instead what we are invited to in a way that is both, at least for me, exciting and terrifying, is to look at Jesus face to face and see where he goes, see what he says, and out of that begin to wrestle with the implications of what that actually might mean for my life as someone who has said yes to him, who has fulfilled the promise that we read today, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I did it, I belong to him. I've been baptized in water, I say Jesus is Lord. There is no question whatsoever that in fact, I'm a Christian and I've been brought into the kingdom of God. But the question in the light of that, particularly in the face of rejecting the idolatry that I had known as a religious system, because all idols perpetrate a religious system that doesn't look like Jesus, was to say, what would you have me be, oh Lord? Not just what would you have me do, but what would you have me be? And it's in the light of that that I really want to look very briefly at the end at this temptation story. You see, Jesus came commissioned. He'd already heard the word of his father, audible, this is my son. And what does the Holy Spirit do? Not what we would have expected at all. He literally sends him into the devil to confront all that would try to keep him from being who he is as God incarnate. There in the personage of Satan, the devil, which I take literally, by the way. If you sort of distill all of those temptations to perhaps one, is there a root? Yes, there is a root. And the root is this, if somehow I can get you to doubt the good character of God, then you'll walk away and try to do it on your own. In other words, the did God say that takes us right back to the Garden of Eden is repeated in this story through the mouth of the devil, doing his best to, in essence, split the Trinity, which of course was impossible. But at least at that point, the devil wasn't sure that could, maybe I can do it. Maybe I'll give it my best shot. Because, of course, a part of the nature of evil is hubris 
a pride and a the capacity that you can do, do more than that which is actually possible. But if you look at the temptation story through that lens, all of a sudden it becomes very and personably applicable. Of course I want to turn stones into bread because I can't trust that God is going to provide for my needs according to his riches and glory. So I better accumulate all that I can because you never what's going to know what's going to happen tomorrow. Of course, if it takes, if the ends justify the means to get what I want, which is really what's going on, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world if you bow down and worship me. Well, of course, God wants us to be healthy and happy and prosperous. And if it means sort of trimming the edges of my own ethics and my business, or even in teaching my kids to do that because everybody has to find a way to get along, that's worth it, right? You see, all of it is a challenge to you and me to begin to re rethink our life in the face of a God who is calling us in the power of the Spirit to a radical dependence upon Him. And it is that dependence upon Him that is, in fact, our testimony to the world so that the explanation of our life is not our resume or our connections that we take such great pride in. No, no, no. The answer, the story of our life actually can only be explained by the miraculous intervention of God. And it is that testimony that calls the world to see the poverty of its own idolatry and to say, what is it that you have that I don't have? That's when real evangelism can in fact happen. Which is why when I, at the beginning, I said adventure doesn't quite capture it, but mission does. The capacity to say yes to him in a way that allows us to be available for him and his service wherever we are because my ultimate allegiance the one upon whom I depend, the one who is in fact the provider of my daily bread, is in fact God himself. It's not my job. It's not my standing in the community because those are themselves idols that keep me from being free in Jesus to be the man that God has called me to be. So beloved in this Lent, I invite you into the adventure that is mission to the reality of all that repentance and new life promises that we saw in the great living, to be leveled, as it were, with every other Christian on the planet who lays down the distinctions that make one better than another, and to come into a new level of dependence upon the Son of God, who is, in fact, the one who loves us dearly and is our only hope. If that is true, and we will together celebrate with extraordinary high joy the resurrection of Jesus. But if not, we'll look along. We'll make do. We'll muddle through. And if that's what you want, you can have it. There is a better way. Amen. Amen. Amen.